Sometimes the work we do is hard, not in terms of the effort expended in the research or the number of drafts that are turned over before we get to a final product or the work or working through the weekends to get it done on time. I mean, it is emotionally difficult, psychically challenging, dispiriting. But this report has been a welcome reprieve. And for the first time in a long time, I am left not disheartened, but hopeful. My name is Joanna Callen, and I'm a researcher here at the Caribbean Policy Research Institute. My role this morning is to welcome you to the online public forum for the launch of the report on the components of an effective social safety net for Jamaica. The research in, that informed the report was carried out under the project civil society organizations as actors of governance and development funded by the European Union. We are very grateful to the EU for their ongoing support. Capri's mission is to conduct evidence-based research to provide answers to Jamaica's most pressing policy questions in the areas of governance, the environment, the economy, and social issues. Many of the issues we research are complex and often, even with the evidence-informed policy recommendations, intractable. They require legislative change, more resources, true political will, fruits that are at the top of a difficult-to-climb tree. The extent to which we engage with the research makes it impossible to avoid internalizing these difficult realities and it can take a toll. This report is different. This report is full of low hanging fruits. Mitigating poverty and bringing more Jamaicans into the growing economy and developing the country is possible and doable and not as difficult or complicated as so many other policy problems we face in Jamaica. And the effects of these policy changes could and would be substantive and meaningful and make Jamaica a better place. We believe that this report's findings will increase your knowledge, enable informed discussions and motivate advocacy for the policy changes we recommend. This morning's events will comprise of the presentation of research findings by Capri's economics researcher, Ms. Monique Graham, followed by a discussion with Dr. Ashu Hando, professor of public policy at North Carolina University and Mrs. Audrey Dare Williams, Chief Technical Director in the Ministry of Labor and Social Security. The discussion will include taking questions from the audience via Slido. The composition of the panel is ideal with a leading practitioner of social safety net related work right here in Jamaica and a leading academic in the field with an international perspective. The discussion will be moderated by Capri's executive director, Dr. Damian King. We at Capri are delighted to have you with us this morning, and we look forward to an engaging and enlightening discussion. Mr. Ricard Bardia Divins, head of corporation representing the EU delegation, will now share remarks. He will be followed by Ms. Graham, who will present the report findings. Morning. Welcome. So glad that you can all join us for this important discussion. Economies are, are dynamic. Economies work best when they are dynamic. When businesses are expanding and contracting, industries are expanding and contracting, because that very dynamism is what supports economic growth. But at at the end, underneath all of that dynamism is changing fortunes for, for individuals, for workers, for households. And so it is critical for an economy to have an effective social safety net. Today we want to talk about Jamaica's social safety net and how effective it is in the course of the normal dynamism of an economy. 
the social safety nets around the world in, in all countries, they have been severely tested by the global pandemic. And many of them, including Jamaicans, have been exposed. They have been found to be wanting. And that was the motivation behind our, our rigorous look at the effectiveness of Jamaica's social safety net. We are now going to present the main findings of the report that we launched this morning. Come back with all your hand. The components of an effective social safety net for Jamaica. I introduce the lead researcher who is going to present our main findings, Ms. Monique Graham. safety. Sadly, the distribution of, of some parts of our social protection mechanism is paradoxically skewed against those who need it the most. For example, of the poorest in our society, 80% do not receive any pensions at all. Come back with me and report. So, In doing so, it assesses the effectiveness of existing programs, highlights the elements or the potential elements of a social safety net, and propose reforms where necessary of these potential elements. It is typical for governments to pursue a range of policies to cater to the most vulnerable. In Jamaica, our current social protection system consists of a PATH program, which is a program of advancement through health and education, the National Insurance Scheme, the NIS, the National Health Fund, NHF, the National Housing Trust, NHT, and the tax exemptions. Now, there also exists youth and adult employment and training programs such as HEART and SPA, the Abilities Foundation, and the Steps to Work program. Now to assess the efficacy of these programs, we will be comparing the intended beneficiaries versus those who actually benefit from the program. The PATH program, is Jamaica's main conditional cash transfer program. And it seeks to alleviate poverty through health and education. It targets the most vulnerable, most of whom fall below the poverty line. Now, in actuality, the PATH program covers or captures majority of its beneficiaries as two thirds of as two thirds are from the poorest 40%. As such, the PATH program is largely, is the program that those who are neediest among us. And when it comes to those who are at a pension of age and do not receive any pensions, not even the NIS, PATH seeks to provide them with social pensions. However, PATH only captures one in eight of the neediest elderly. This is concerning. The main pension scheme, however, is a national insurance scheme, which provides pensions or seeks to provide pensions for all the employed, including the self-employed. When we look at the distribution of the NIS, we realize that only a third of the poorest 40% receive an NIS pension. Given that Jamaica has an aging population, that is those 60 years and older, they're the fastest growing population in the country. 
It is very worrying that HAP and NIS seem to miss a large portion of its intended beneficiaries or in its intended target. Help is also important and the National Health Fund seeks to provide those who are suffering from chronic illnesses such as asthma, diabetes or hypertension with pharmaceutical subsidies with pharmaceutical subsidies. Now, of this proportion, only 48% benefit from the NHF. If we should look at the distribution of the benefits across quintiles, we realize that 90% of the beneficiaries do not constitute those who are below the poverty line. is the cost of medicinal drugs and it has a relatively high co-payment and as such it mostly benefits the rich rather than the poor further a product that the poor can't afford anyway is not a good element of a social protection architecture and so the nhf is ineffective as a social protection policy. The National Housing Trust seeks to make housing more, affo more affordable for its contributors, and these include low-income workers. However, majority of the benefits are accrued to high-income earners as they are twice as likely to receive mortgages than low-income workers low-income workers. While it is that the poor aspire to own or have their own home, their priority is not to get a house. It is to know where the next meal will come from and contributing to the NHT does not help them to achieve this. Therefore, the NHT is not a good policy as a social protection architecture. There are also tax exemptions, and based on the purpose of these, it, it, it would seem as though these should accrue more benefits to the poor, as they aim to reduce the cost of basic consumption items for poor households, such as food. Now, we will illustrate this using the example of canned items, canned food items. In 2017, poor household items. This, as opposed to the wealthiest 20% of the population who consumed 200,000 worth of canned items. Put simply, for each can, for each item of canned food that the poor consumed, the rich consumed poor. This illustrates that tax exemptions heavily subsidize the expenditure of the rich and yields little benefit to the poor. A simply fiscally inefficient way of targeting the poor. There are other ways to help the most vulnerable. This can be done through job training and employment programs. The Heart Trust NTA is Jamaica's main job training and employment program. And it, see, it targets at risk and unattached youth to address the problem of high youth unemployment. To, to better facilitate this group, Heart lowered its minimum requirements so that enrollment would be more attainable for vulnerable youths. Having done this, having done this, um, Heart saw an increase in their enrollment. However, as illustrated or as outlined in the Auditor General's report, the lack of effective monitoring and evaluation. It um, undermined the efficacy 
of these programs, causing heart to achieve suboptimal um, outcomes. Now, more disadvantaged than their able bodied counterparts, well, than one with disabilities were in paid employment. To improve this unimpressive outcome, the Abilities Foundation, as the only cross disability institution, seeks to provide job training and employment to youths with disabilities. In Jamaica, there are approximately 36,000 youths with disabilities. However, on average, since the Abilities Foundation's inception, it has an annual enrollment average of 93 youths, of 93 youths with disabilities. This is less than 1% of its target population. And further, majority of these enrollees are from the Kingston metropolitan area. Research has shown that majority of the persons with disabilities in Jamaica reside in rural areas. And as such, the Abilities Foundation is poorly targeted. Also targeting a specific group is the Steps to Work program. This program provides training and exposure to employment opportunities to path beneficiaries. In 2019, out of 32,000 eligible PATH recipients, only 2,000 benefited from the program, less than 10% of its target. As a result, the Steps to Work program is poorly targeted. Its voluntary clause significantly impedes its ability to reach majority of its the PATH program, the NIS, the HEART NSDA, the Abilities Foundation, and the Steps to Work program. These potential elements, however, need to be reformed. PATH beneficiaries receive $4,100 every two months. This is a quarter of the international daily poverty line. As such, it is necessary for the payouts to be increased if it, if it is to have a stronger impact on alleviating poverty. Also, the conditionalities seem to be more harmful on the beneficiaries than intended because the punitive response to non-compliance reduces the benefit to 1,600 Jamaican dollars every two months. During the 2019-2020 financial year alone, these poor families were, these poor families lost out on 278 million Jamaican dollars. It does not solve the inherent issue or problem of lack of money if it is that you are withholding money for non-compliance. Given that Jamaica has an aging population and majority of the poorest, the, the, the neediest um, elderly among us are not receiving any pensions, it is necessary for the government to implement a universal pension scheme. This will provide each elderly with um, income every month, ensuring that even the poorest of them Um, medical expenses is one of the surest way for vulnerable families to fall into poverty. And we see that during this crisis. So the government needs to implement 
a universal health insurance scheme, similar to the one that was designed and drafted by the Ministry of Health and Wellness in 2019. The Heart Trust NTA is very important to provide youth at risk and unattached youth with the necessary skills they need to, to transition into the workforce. As such, Heart needs to systematically monitor and evaluate its program programs to improve the efficacy. Economic inclusion is very economic inclusion of persons with disabilities is very important. And the Abilities Foundation is in a unique position to do this. As such, they should establish facilities outside of the Kingston region to increase their targeting efficiency. Now, because the Steps to Work program is voluntary, it is necessary that more resources be devoted to promotion, recruitment, and incentivization in order for the program to increase its throughput and graduate path beneficiaries to financial self-independence. Now, these reforms must begin by enacting legislation. The parliament should pass the National Assistance Bill to replace the Poor Relief Act of 1886. This act was last amended over almost over 50 years ago. Parliament should also table the codes of practice component of the Disabilities Act, as it is crucial for the act's enactment and thereby the inclusion of persons with disabilities. Inclusive growth is attainable in Jamaica. The policies that constitute an effective social protection architecture, them already there. The government just needs to shift resources from ineffective policies to those that have better targeting efficiency and more impact in alleviating poverty among our most vulnerable. Come, make you hold your hand. lead researcher on this project for us. Before we get into the discussion with our two panelists and with the wider audience who will be interacting with us remotely, I would like to introduce Mr. Ricard Bardia Divins, who is the head of cooperation at the EU delegation in Jamaica. The European Union supports Capri's work and has supported this particular project uh, in particular. And so I'd like to ask him to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. King. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to, to say a few words on behalf of the European Union to highlight the importance of, the, of this topic uh, that will be discussed. Social protection is a fundamental right and is uh, um, enshrined as such in the Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights and as well in other major United Nations uh, human rights instruments. The adoption of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development has reaffirmed uh, the global commitment which prioritizes social protection and as a means to achieve uh, several uh, SDGs. For example, SDG 1.3 calls upon countries to implement nationally appropriate social protection mechanism for all, for reducing and preventing poverty. SDG 3.8 calls to achieving universal health coverage, including financial risk protection, 
access to quality essential health care services and access to safe, effective and affordable essential medicines and vaccines for all. And as well, the SDG 8 aims to develop and operationalize a global strategy for youth employment. Social protection plays a key role in accelerating progress towards achieving all the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals and in leaving no one behind. Social protection is also a pillar of the European Union policies and programs to promote sustainable social and economic development and decent work inside the European Union, but as well beyond the EU borders in line of, you know, in line with, with our, uh, our values. As effect of the, of the COVID pandemic, uh, an increasing number of partners are expanding their social protection programs or putting new ones in place. However, various challenges like coherence across sectors and financial policies persist. The COVID-19 pandemic constitutes an unprecedented challenge for all with significant immediate as well as longer term social and economic implications. With its outbreak in 2020, besides the immediate health response, social protection has quickly emerged as an effective crisis response mechanism to the socioeconomic impact of the pandemic and thus gain considerable importance in international cooperation. There is no doubt that the capacity of Jamaica to respond to the pandemic in 2020 and mitigate some of its effects has been facilitated by programs like PATH and others that have been assessed by Capri in the report that is presented and discussed today. It is important to maintain and expand this fiscal space and delivery capacity of social protection uh, systems during this crisis. Continued investment in social protection will also be key once countries move into recovery. And this will also make systems more resilient to face future shocks. In 2020, the pandemic has revealed the structural weakness of social protection mechanisms. One could say that the pandemic is like a stress test revealing the strengths and weaknesses of our societies and social systems. For all these reasons, it's a very good moment to raise the issue of inclusive growth and social protection in the public debate with this report prepared by Capri and co-funded by the, the EU. This action aims to enhance governance and accountability by improving the responsiveness of policies in the areas of empowerment of women, youth advocacy, and economic inclusion. With this support, the European Union is helping civil society actors to participate in public debate through informed decision-making, free from interference, and preserving open democratic debate. I would like uh, to congratulate Capri for choosing to invest the, the EU contribution to nourish the debate around this topic and for proposing recommendations that can be the base for future and better policies and programs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ricardo. You know, this, this is really one of the most important questions, one of the most important policy questions that a society faces. And the answers that we can come to and agree on today is going to be a critical part of how Jamaica moves forward. It is for that reason why I am particularly pleased to have the two commentators that we've been able to get to agree to participate today. We have Mrs. Audrey Dale-Williams, who is the Chief Technical Director of the Ministry of Labour and Social Security. 
she is representing the policymakers in this area. And they're, of course, critical to the discussion. It gives me an enormous pleasure to welcome our other panelists, Professor Saranshu Handa, who is Professor of Public Policy at the University of North Carolina, one of the world's leading uh, authorities and academics on the area of social protection and a great friend of Jamaica. Between Mrs. Williams and Professor Handa, I know we are going to have an enormously fruitful discussion. I'm going to ask both of them to start off, to kick off the discussion by giving their reactions to the report and to this area in general. I'm going to start off with you, Mrs. Williams, from the Ministry of Labor and Social Security. Thank you, Dr. King. Uh, allow me to acknowledge Mr. Bardia, head of corporation representing the EU, my other panelists, Dr. Professor Hanna, Handa, and of course, we have to acknowledge Ms. Monique Graham, researcher. Also, allow me to say good morning to other invited guests and others who are tuned in. Good morning, everybody. I want to start by congratulating Ms. Graham on her report, Come Make We Hold Your Hand. Her effort in shining the light on the state of social protection in Jamaica is certainly commendable. You know, very often persons see social protection as a poor people business. But in fact, social protection is everybody's business. COVID-19 would have taught us that at any moment, any one of us could find ourselves among the vulnerable group. So we in the Ministry of Labor and Social Security welcome the report and look forward to discussing the recommendations as you heard outlined earlier. I can state that some of the recommendations are actually policy decisions that we have already taken and are implementing. There are other recommendations though that I think merit further discussion and so we look forward to the debate. We thank Capri for inviting us to be a part of this forum, and we wish for all a successful session today. Thank you. And now over to Ashu. Welcome. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you and thank you for uh, the invitation. And I am indeed uh, an old friend of this topic and of Jamaica. I was a lecturer and colleague of Dr. King at UWI many, many years ago now, <laughs> too long. And in fact, um, I did work on the reforms of the social protection and safety net program in Jamaica and between uh, 2000, 2002, and some of those reforms and discussions are actually mentioned in the report. Um, so I have a pretty long history, and the thing that struck me the most as I read the, the report, which I thought was very well done, was really the path dependency of the social protection system in Jamaica. Some of the issues that we identified way back then, almost 20 years ago, continue to be, you know, issues today. Um, and so hopefully this report and, you know, the pandemic will trigger a renewed sort of commitment to revisiting those issues and making some progress on them. Let me start off by saying, uh, amplifying what Mrs. Williams said, which is that, um, you know, social protection is again, not just about poor people. It is about the type of society that you want. Um, putting on my economist hat, I will say that it's now pretty well established that a strong social protection system actually contributes directly to economic growth. So back in the day, there seemed to be this trade-off between equity, um, distribution, and growth. And now we have come to realize, you know, based on several decades of evidence, that actually social protection 
does have a role to play directly in promoting economic growth. Um, so I think that's quite important right off the bat just to, to establish that and understand that. In terms of what I view as kind of the big issues that uh, Jamaica ought to address at this point, um, I'm going to highlight a couple of them. First, I would say that Jamaica is a little bit behind the frontier, um, you know, in comparison to other countries at the same level of income on two very important um, areas. One is on health insurance and the other is on pensions. Um, both have been, I think, appropriately addressed in the report, right? But really, if you look across similar countries, similar levels of development, you see that there is this movement towards some sort of universal health insurance, whether, and there, there are ways to, to go to get from, from, from zero to there. Um, there's an interesting program in Mexico, for example, um, which is a sort of targeted health insurance program. There's an interesting program in Ghana, the national health insurance plan there. So they are interesting examples where you could start off with a targeted system. You could start off with some um, tiered fee waivers, right, depending on where you fall in the income distribution. But I think everyone understands that health shocks are a major issue, right, um, for the poor. Um, I'm, I know I'm running off of my three minutes, so I'll, I'll say one more area that I think Jamaica is a little bit behind the, the um the international benchmark, and that is obviously on pensions. And here I think the approach suggested of the contributory versus universal and providing incentives to move to the contributory is excellent and they're great examples. Um, and so that would be, I think, two areas to look at. So I run out of time. I do have some other things to say that might come up in the question and answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashu. Okay. Uh between what Mrs. Williams has said and what Professor Handa has said, and coming out of the report, there's really a lot for us to dig into here. So, so let, let, let us start that off. Uh, we are accepting questions over a platform called Slido. Just go to slido.com and put in the event code Capri and you can post questions. And also, you can vote on questions that others have posted. And those are the questions that we're going to put to our, our lead researcher and our analysts. And the first question, unsurprisingly, that has come up is, how is this going to be afforded? How is this going to be paid for? So, Monique, I'm going to ask you to address the, the funding of all of this uh, immediately. Okay. A pleasant morning to everyone. Thanks for that question. So this package, it costs between 40 and 50 billion. Now, we emphasized before that it is important that the government shifts resources from policies that are ineffective. So based on the current budget for those policies, and that is the NHT and the NHF, we know that already half of the budget can, already, can be funded from these two corporations. In addition to that, the eradication of the tax exemptions will also support this half. Now, remember that we are talking about inclusive growth. And as Professor um, Handa said, inclusive growth contributes to a country's economy. And from this, there are economic gains. As such, the latter half can be funded from the fiscal dividend that is to be gained, um, that is to be earned from um, promoting and actually instituting policies that foster inclusive growth. Uh, thank you. So, so some of it from reallocation from ineffective programs and some of it from the fiscal dividend that comes from economic growth. Uh, you had mentioned, Mrs. Williams, about some of the recommendations already sort of being thought about and moving towards implementations, implementation. So 
can you just identify, you know, which of those is, you know, are already on the government radar? Uh, sure. For instance, Monique recommended that the conditionalities that uh, related to PAT should be reviewed. Well, she said removed. And I can assure her that as we speak, the ministry is in fact reviewing the conditionalities because PATH has been around for 20 years and we are in fact also doing a tracer study to see what impact the program has had on our beneficiaries. So that will help guide policy as well. So we are in fact reviewing the conditionalities. So we accept that. And, and that is in train. I also need to mention though, Monique spoke about the social pension. No, I believe she's referring to the elderly benefit under the PATH program, which was not really designed as a social pension. In fact, you may be aware that in the new financial year, 21, 22, we will be launching an official social pension and that will it will not be universal because of that first question which was asked the cost uh, it will be targeted targeted at persons 75 years and older who are not on path who do not receive nis and who are not in government institutionalized care so that we intend to launch in in the first payment is due in july of this year so we have we are putting in place and a proper so a, a direct social pension and in fact i need to mention that the payments under the social pension will be about 30 percent higher than the elderly benefit now on the path that's actually that, that, that's fantastic to, to hear audrey uh, uh, because because you know, coming out of our analysis, Capri's analysis was that those areas are actually critical. Since we talk about, since the report talks about the conditionalities, and you have mentioned that the conditionalities are being reviewed, well, this is a perfect time to ask Ashu, who not only is he one of the world's leading authorities and academics on the area of social protection, but in particular on cash transfer programs. So Ashu, can you talk about well, sort of in general about the effectiveness of cash, cash transfer programs, you know, there's a lot of suspicion about, you know, giving money to people and how irresponsible people are going to be with it and, and supporting a freeness mentality. So just, just talk a little bit about the effectiveness of cash, cash transfer programs and in particular about the need for conditionalities or the need for conditionalities. Sure. This is... Um a little bit of a hot button issue, definitely. Um, I would say that, you, you know, research over the last decade culm culminating in, in several pretty high profile review articles have shown without doubt that, you know, the poor use money wisely. Obviously they're very resource constrained and they use actually money much more wisely than, than the middle class do because precisely they are you know, working under conditions of extreme scarcity. So this idea, you know, this idea, this myth has been completely busted, right? Which is that um, a little bit of cash is going to lead people to stop working and to start, you know, smoking and drinking. So that, I think the evidence is very clear on that. Then there's the second issue of conditionality, right? Um, and here again, I think the, the unfortunately, the, um, and I was part, again, I was part of the 20, the 2000, 2002 reform where we moved from the food stamp program to the PATH program. And at that time, there was a very rigorous debate around the issue of conditionality. Um, and I would say that it wasn't a, it wasn't agreed upon by all parties, but ultimately um, conditions were instituted in that PATH program. Um, one of the issues we said at the time was that conditions reduce the value of the transfer because you're required to spend time doing stuff and that obviously is a resource drain secondly what are the what is the purpose of the program right is it a social protection income support program or is it an education program or is it a health program conditions relate to education they relate to health 
Is that what the Ministry of Labor or Ministry of Social Welfare, you know, is that their sort of purpose? Isn't the, aren't those things better left to those line ministries, right? Um, and then finally, particularly in developing countries and particularly I would say in Jamaica amongst, you know, poor areas, the quality of health facilities, the quality of schooling is a real big issue, right? And I think, you know, everyone wants to go to a good school. And when the school is not good and when, you know, you're sitting with 40 people and the teacher is not motivated and it's hot, um, you're not really learning much. To then condition poor households to force their kids into that situation um, just doesn't really, you know, make sense. And I think the world is coming around to that slowly. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, a viewer through Slido is examining the components that we have proposed and is noting the absence uh, money of, of unemployment insurance. I know it must have come up in the research, so can you say something about the absence of a proposal for unemployment insurance? Why is it not there? Okay, so unemployment insurance, that is really for persons who have a job or are working and for a particular time. Now, as a, as a social protection policy, it will not work because a lot of these persons do not have jobs to begin with. And a lot of them occupy informal employment. And so even if it is that they're working, they would not benefit from unemployment insurance. Further, where it is that persons actually benefit from these, um, these payments, it is for a short period. And so we find that that does not really have a strong impact on alleviating poverty, right? Um, a research was done on the Caribbean and it showed that because of the, the large informal sector, in the in uh, in the region right it would not it would not serve the purpose of pushing people into the formal sector but rather it may foster um, them staying in the informal sector and collecting those benefits thank you um a slide of viewer you know we have the, the report focuses on on the policy what are the components of an effective social safety net? And didn't pay any attention to the institutional framework in which that policy is implemented. And someone has asked on Slido about, about that difference. And I think I'd like you to answer that question, Audrey, from the Minister of Labor and Social Security. And the question is, if we had all of the components of the social safety net under a single ministry, would that make the programs more effective? Would that make the management of them more efficient? Is that something we ought to be looking for? Uh, and this is my personal opinion now. I'm not sure that that would necessarily improve efficiency. Uh, what we are looking at is a social protection strategy that involves uh, a system where we can cross-reference and cross-check um, to see who is benefiting from what program. So we are examining that that is more where we are going, not necessarily where we would have all of them under one, one umbrella. In fact, though, recall that we do have opportunities for networking because we do meet at the National Social Protection Committee at the Planning Institute and we do exchange ideas and we we benefit from those discourses. So I, I'm, I'm not sure and, and, and um, that is my personal opinion. We are also looking at strengthening referrals uh, around the system so that if a person enters one as one area of the system they can be referred to another aspect we are looking more into case management of our of our applicants or beneficiaries 
rather than having them all housed under the same umbrella. Thank you. Ashu, you had mentioned in your remarks an element of this discussion which has certainly not been part of the public debate around the social safety net in Tobacco, even though I know it has come out elsewhere. And that is the nexus between a social safety net, which is normally looked at in terms of us just wanting to be sort of kind to the poor, the nexus between the social safety net and economic growth. And Jamaica has become quite focused on the issue of economic growth in recent years. So if you can talk a little bit more from it about how having an effective social safety net and social protection is important to economic growth. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there, there's, some, there's a nice framework for social protection, which talks about promote, promotive versus preventive. Um, and that framework really helps us understand how um, certain types of social protection, such as youth, like addressing youth unemployment, um, addressing early childhood development, um, which are targeted at, on the one hand, directly contribute to skills building and directly contribute to otherwise marginalized groups being able to fully participate, right, and contribute to the economy. And that's the sense on the one hand in, in which you can have this direct contribution. The other way is that, of course, you know, even something like health insurance that's universal and that's accessible directly contributes because it reduces, you know, the days lost to sickness, it reduces all kinds of, you know, um, un, you know, lo loss of productivity related to, to health, right, which is perfectly normal in society. So these are, these are just kind of two examples of, of how social protection um, that's comprehensive, that addresses the life cycle, right, um, can directly contribute to economic growth. It's, it's not an either or, okay? Thanks very much. Okay, we, we've gone through a number of the issues. I'm going to ask the, the viewers online to go on to Slido and participate in our polls. One poll is asking, is as we come to the end of this discussion, is asking if you feel you have a better understanding of the issue of what are the components of an effective social safety net at the end of this discussion and presentation than you had at the beginning. And a uh, second poll question is simply asking you to rate the event that you've been, that you've been able to see. I'm going to go back to our two panelists and ask first, Mrs. Williams and then Professor Handel to, to wrap up and give us any any thoughts or any issues that they want to bring out that they that you know not able so they were not able to mention before. So we can have a, a, you know, a comprehensive look at everything that is relevant to an effective social safety net. First to you, Mrs. Williams. Thanks again. So as I said earlier, we welcome every opportunity to talk about social protection. It's what we do every day, and we hope we are getting better at it and that we will achieve the mission of the ministry, which is to improve the lives of the persons we serve. And so as we, as we continue these discussions, we welcome any additional feedback that we can have. And as we continue to build out our systems and our processes, um, we will ensure that we, uh, the systems are more efficient and can really benefit and reach more persons, as Monique is suggesting, um, that we need to reach more persons. So we welcome the feedback and we look forward to continuing um, in, in the debates. give us some, some final thoughts and mention anything else relevant to this discussion that you think has not been brought out yet. Sure, thanks a lot. And I um, really appreciated the comments from Mrs. Williams, by the way. Um, 
I would say that there's this very famous um, quote, right? That programs for the poor are poor programs. And I think that's what Mrs. Williams also kind of started off by saying. I think it's important as you move forward to develop this sort of comprehensive life cycle vulnerabilities framework, um, you know, overlaid with sort of risk management strategies as a way of really pitching this idea of social protection and social protection system as something that benefits the entire country. Now, of course, there is a particular focus on vulnerable groups and, you know, there are particular programs that are trying to, to reach people who are marginalized. But by and large, you know, the big components, the pillars of a social protection system, right, the pension system, the health insurance system, are things that affect everybody. And I think that's the way to really approach this. And I think it's high time that Jamaica, you know, given where it, where it fits in globally, it's really high time that Jamaica adopted that approach and really, you know, sold to its citizens that a comprehensive system benefits everybody, right, to get the buy-in. And I think to do that, you know, you need a policy, you need the framework, and then that needs to be adopted by cabinet, and then you need to reform, you know, the, the act, the Poor Relief Act accordingly. Thank you. Thank you very much. What we are dealing with here is to try to put together, to try to focus on, on what are the effective components of a good social safety net. There's a, there are a combination of factors that come into play, uh, some of which are important and some are not. The social safety net that a country ends up having may be informed by what works, but it is also informed by what is electorally popular and what is sacred because it's been around for a long time and was instituted by some you know, well-respected, long-dead political figure. We really need to, to be rigorous about focusing on what is effective and what works for the society. And that is the process in which we're engaged. That is how we have done the research. That is how we have brought in Mrs. Williams and Professor Handa to give us some, some guidance on this. Some really important points have come out here. One of which is that, is that the social safety net is not only about wanting to be in a type of society that protects its most vulnerable members and the weakest members of society, which is almost a spiritual consideration. What has come out is that an, an effective social safety net works for the whole society and that it is critical to economic growth. And we wanted more than anything to come out of the research and the discussion to have a focus. And the focus seems to be that cash transfer programs are, are effective and we need to move along towards reforming and putting more resources into our cash transfer program, particularly in relation to the role of conditionalities. And two areas that have shown to be most effective and in which Jamaica is behind, which is pensions and health insurance, universal health insurance and a pension scheme that is also universal and goes to all of the elderly. That is where we need to move forward. I'm going to close off this, this discussion by asking Capri's Joanna Callen to give us some closing remarks and, and final sign off. Joanna? And that is the conclusion of our event today. We would like to thank our panelists, our sponsors, and of course, our audience members for joining Capri's discussion today. Our report will be available on our website, caprion.org. And enjoy the rest of your day, ladies and gentlemen.